It's time to accelerate. Hi, I'm your host, Andy Paul. Join me as I host conversations with the leading experts in sales, marketing, sales automation, sales process, leadership, management, training, coaching, any resource that I believe to help you accelerate the growth of your sales, your business, and most importantly, you. Hello, and welcome to Accelerate. I'm excited to talk with my guest today. Joining me is Paul Smith, author of Sell with a Story. And along with his previous book, Lead with a Story and Parenting with a Story, these are all great books about why we need to incorporate storytelling into every aspect of our lives. Now, one of the stories of the moment in sales is stories. That's right, storytelling is big. And I said before, for reasons I'll talk about with my guests, story should be an essential part of every sales rep's arsenal. But not enough reps are taking ownership of their stories, and it's for that reason I wanted to talk with my guest today, Paul Smith, Because stories are one of those things salespeople can use to differentiate themselves from their competitors and to quickly and easily build rapport and trust with their prospects. And Paul's going to help us understand how you can do that and incorporate stories into your selling. Paul, welcome to the show. Well, Andy, thanks very much for having me. So take a minute, please. Introduce yourself to the audience. Yeah, so I I probably spent 20 or so years of my life at uh, Procter & Gamble in various different roles and levels of management. But I, the two of those tours of duty during that 20 years were on sales teams. I was on the um, P&G sales team for the Costco and BJ's business, mm-hmm. um, which is headquartered out on the West Coast, and also on our Walmart and Sam's Club sales uh, team, which is down in Arkansas near near Bentonville, obviously. Um, so probably seven of my, uh, my 20 years were in multifunctional sales team environments. Um, and uh, prior to that, uh, prior to business school, I spent a couple of years as a consultant at Arthur Anderson uh, and Company. But only in the last three years uh, since I left P and G, uh, I've I've now shifted full time to to being an author and a, a speaker and trainer. And what I I spend most of my time doing now is doing the research and writing the the books that I write. And I'm on about a two year cycle with books coming out. Um, and but I probably spend a third of my time or a quarter of my time. On the road with clients, and what I typically do is, uh, is when I'm not doing a keynote speech or something, I'm teaching a leadership team or a sales team how to be better leaders or better salespeople through the art and the science of storytelling. So essentially, uh, creating a workshop and training course out of the material in, in the book. Okay. So when you were selling to Walmart, let's say, what, what were you selling? Well, just about everything P and G sold, and my, my particular role on the team was I was in charge of consumer research. Uh, so I wasn't the uh, the guy carrying the bag with the sales responsibility. So full disclosure there. Um, but I spent probably seven, like I said, seven years of my life on those two teams. First as the finance manager of, of the team, and then secondly as the consumer research expert on the team. And 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 the and I found myself in buyer's office on every brand that we made, and we made over two hundred different brands of everything you can imagine in your pantry at home. Half of it's probably made by P and G. Yeah, yeah. Starting start with the diapers, all the way up to yeah. the food that goes into it. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So, what was the impetus for writing? Well, let's start with with the storytelling in general. I mean, you have three books now about storytelling. The last one, you know, get into in depth about selling with a story. But you know, what was what was missing that you saw out there about? Uh, stories and how to integrate them into our daily lives and our, our business lives. Yeah, I, you know, I guess it, it probably took me 15 years to figure this out. Maybe I'm just a slow learner, but, um, you know, after 15 or so years at P&G, I finally recognized that the leaders that I respected the most, that I, I wanted to be like when I grew up in the company, um, that I wanted to work for, uh, had this this gift of being really charismatic, engaging storytellers. And, and I wanted that for myself because I, I wanted to be successful as a leader in the company. Um, and, but I realized that's not a skill that they taught me in business school. That's not a skill that, uh, you know, they taught me when I joined the company. It's not in any training class I've been to. Uh, you know, so I, I set out to learn that skill on my own and I ended up interviewing, gosh, now I'm up to like 250 or 300 CEOs and executives and salespeople all over the world and all kinds of different companies. Um, and at some point along that path, I realized, well, gosh, if, if, if I want to know this, this badly, <laughs> and probably there's some other people that do as well. And so my own personal learning journey morphed into, uh, a, a, a book project. 
Uh, and that's what led to my first book and to the second book and now to the third book is is continuing on that learning, my own personal learning journey of interviewing more people and studying the art and the science more um, uh, more specifically and scientifically and, and through research. Uh, and that's what I spend all of my time doing now. So in your research, have you found that there are certain – I mean, because you're talking about storytelling really as a learned behavior. And are, is there a personality type that adapts to stories more quickly than other personality types? Yeah, clearly. You know, and, and, you know, it's probably not too surprising to you that many of those type of people are drawn to a sales profession. They're, they're more outgoing, gregarious uh, people. Um, so just like there are, um, you know, people that are natural born musicians or artists, there are, I think there are people who are natural born storytellers. But what I've found is that many people assume that since that's the case, if they're not one of those natural born storytellers, well, they're just never going to have that talent. And that's just not the case. And it's, it's just like art and music. You know, I'm not a natural born artist or musician in any sense. But I bet if I wanted to learn to play the guitar, I could probably take lessons and learn to play. You know, six months into it, I'd probably be able to strum out at least a few songs. And nobody's ever going to, you know, I'm not going to fill up Carnegie Hall with people wanting to listen to me play the guitar, but I can probably get decent at it. Well, you and never I know. I'll tell you, well, try you, never know. you could You're be right. filling I could. it. You could, <laughs> could. be. But, but I think it's the same thing with storytelling. Yes, of course, there are going to be people that are born with that natural talent. But for those of us that are not, you can learn it. It is a learnable skill. Most people just don't know, well, how on earth would I go learn that? You can't go take classes in storytelling, can you? Well, that's kind of what I do for a living now. And there are actually a lot of people that do that for a living now for that exact purpose. Or you can pick up a, a book and, and read it. And so uh, it is a learnable skill once you realize that it is a skill that you need and that you can learn it. If you set your mind to it, you can, you can learn it. Well, right. And once you've learned it, it so it goes back to your story about being a musician that you never play at Carnegie Hall. It sort of invokes the old story about how do you get to Carnegie Hall? You know, practice, practice, practice. practice. Right. And <laughs> right. that's really true of storytelling. Is once you understand what it is that that a story is and how to integrate it into your selling, it's all about practice at that point to make yourself make it second nature for you. So let's yes, talk a little bit about what a story is because you, in the sales context, you you do a good job sort of laying out what a story is versus what you saw all his companies start talking about is this is our story, right? Mm -hmm. So why is this distinction so misunderstood? And tell us what the difference is. Yeah, so these days, I think the word story, uh, for better or worse, has has gotten so much, it's gotten so popular, it has so much use Misappropriated. Now. Yeah, yeah, that's a good word for it. I think it's been misappropriated. I mean, you'll hear people say, oh, our, our marketing strategy is a story, our our, our television copy is a story. Our mission statement is a story. Our brand logo is a story. And, well, probably they're not. <laughs> probably they're just mission statements and brand logos and uh, marketing campaigns. Mm -hmm. um, so I, a story, you know, it's like, a, it's like not every set of words that has meaning is a poem. A poem is something very specific. It's a specific set of types of, of words and language put together. And a story is the same way. It's, it's, it's something unique. It's not, ev not everything that has meaning is a story. You know, a story is – if you're to ask a 10-year-old kid what a story is, they will know, right? The grown-up the grown some has, sometimes has trouble articulating what a story is, but a kid knows. It, uh, and I've asked kids this question to find out. And what they'll tell you is, oh, a story. That's when you tell somebody about something that happened to somebody. Exactly. That's what a story is. It's, it's when you're telling somebody about something that happened to somebody, right? So a story has characters, it has events, it has a time and a place, it, you know, it's a once upon a time something happened or more likely it's, you know, two years ago when I first joined the company, blah, 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 something happened. So it, it has a time, a place, characters, those characters have a goal or a motivation. There's usually uh, a, a villain or an obstacle or a challenge confronting that person. And at the end, there's some kind of a resolution. They either succeed over the obstacle or they fail to succeed over the obstacle. And there's a lesson learned at the end of it. I mean, that's what a story is. You know, um, a, a testimonial that you, know, you should buy this product because it's awesome is not a story or the most important three things I learned in this job are, you know, one, two, three. Well, that's not a story. That's advice. And those are all important things too. You know, testimonials are important. Advice is important. 30-second television commercials are important. But they're not necessarily stories. Stories are something unique and, and authentic and genuine that communicates something that many of those other forms of communication can't. And, 
And and uh, and if you're confused of whether whether it's a story or not, ask ask your kid, and <laughs> they'll tell you that was a story or no, that was not a story. Well, right, and and you talk about you sort of went through that. And, you know, sort of your six elements of what a story contains. You said it takes place, it has a time frame to it. And I think it's mm-hmm. important for people to sort of understand this. They think about a story is really simply has a time frame, has a place where it takes. I mean, you're talking about adding a level of detail, and this is I think the thing that people really forget about storytelling is. You had some detail to it. As you said, right. a time. Two years ago, I, or in 1988, I, a place that you know took place in a specific place. There's a hero to the story. As you said, the challenge, an obstacle, a villain that could be connected with that, and then always an outcome, a resolution. And the thing that's interesting about the story is that, as you know, I've talked about with other guests and in books I've written, is that you know, this is the same structure we use for writing scripts for TV and for movies mm-hmm. and the, the books follow, that the popular entertainment that we're so consumed with, even scripted reality shows, all follow the same arc. Right. Otherwise, this is what we're, well, it's almost like we're genetically programmed to, to expect this. So that's just these basic elements have to be there. Right, but if you don't know what they are, you, you we naturally revert to what we think is the most appropriate type of communication for business, which is just the facts. tell people very logically and fact based what what you want them to do or what you what you think or something, and we we avoid stories somehow because we think they're not appropriate, and that's one of the biggest learnings is they're highly appropriate. I mean, human beings make <clears throat> emotional subconscious decisions, uh, and you know. Uh, Often ir- uh, irrational ones as well as as we're, we're learning from a lot of the the recent you know cognitive science. But if you want to influence people's decisions, then you've got to influence them in both halves of their brain. You can't just speak to the logical rational part of them. And and our normal logic based communication only reaches half the brain, and stories can reach that other half. And that's turns out that's where real decisions are actually made. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So. Lots is written about stories, but I mean, to me, for sales, it seems like it's a real obstacle and a barrier to get reps and sales reps to really embrace it because they seem like it's it's hard, right? Um, so, why is it that you, in your experience, why are you finding they're resisting storytelling? Because once you know how to do it, it's a great simplifying tool for your selling. Yeah, it is. Now, in in the research for this book, I, I was I was pleasantly. I don't know if surprised is the right word, but it was pleasant to find out that uh, it, among all the groups of people that I've studied storytelling among, whether it's CEOs or executives or engineers or marketing people or you know salespeople uh, uh, attach themselves to and and use storytelling much more readily than other people. And I think that goes back to the original question you asked: Are there certain personality types that are more predisposed to it? And and I think that personality type finds itself in sales more often than. Uh, than the the population at large, so it, convincing salespeople that they ought to be telling more stories is not is generally not a hard sell. Teaching them how is just as difficult as it is to teach anybody else, um, or just as easy depending on how you look at it. Um, but but I, I don't often have sales audiences say no. I I absolutely never want to tell a story. Um, what I have found is that they're very limited in where they want to use stories. Um, but they, but it wasn't consistent. So I, I, I interviewed sales and and, pro, and procurement people across fifty different companies, and I found twenty four different places in this entire sales process where salespeople are telling stories. But most of them are only telling it in three or four of those twenty four places. Um, but but you might be using it in the first four, and I might be using it in the second four, and somebody else is using it in the third four. Mm-hmm. And and the reason why we're not using it in the other 20 is because we don't know we can or we don't know that stories are appropriate there. And what I'm finding is that, well, they are. And some salespeople are using them in all 24, but most of us are limiting ourselves to the two or three or four that we just – naturally came across and started using. You know, so some of us are using storytelling to introduce themselves to new prospects and explain what they do and how they help other clients. And some are using it purely for our own purposes to give ourselves a motivational talk before we go into that sales call and take the stress out of the call. You know, some of us are using it to build rapport with the buyers and 
you know, explain why I do what I do and, uh, you know, tell them, explain to them through a story that, you know, if I'll tell you when I make a mistake or I'll tell you when I can't help you or I'll go to bat for you with my company if I need to. You know, those are three different stories that you might use in that rapport building. And some of us are using it to explain the founding story of our company. Some are using it in the main sales pitch itself to explain what the product is and what it does and how it works and, you know, and some of us are saving the story until the close or, or till we're handling objections or till we're negotiating price because that's where it gets the stickiest for us and we know we need that, that sales pitch. So, so different salespeople are using it in different places, but the, the good news is, gosh, you can use it in all of them now that, now that you know that you can. And so that's the, the first third of the book is really laying out what are those 24 different places in a typical sales process where salespeople can and should be telling stories. It's, it's the second third of the book that's all, the second two thirds of the book that's all about the how, the, the structure of a story and emotion and surprise and the real nitty gritty, you know, get your hands dirty. How do you construct a story? But mm -hmm. first, I had to take people through wh why and when and where in my entire sales process should I be using storytelling? That was some of the biggest eye opening for me in writing the book was that it would be that useful from beginning to end of the sales process. Well, we're going to take a short break. When we come back, though, I want to talk about the why stories are so important because I think before people really embrace it, you have really had some great points in your in your book about how the how the stories help you, as I said, build your, your rapport. And really, you know, if you reduce sales to sort of this no, what I call the no like trust mm -hmm. equation, right? People buy from people they know, like, and trust. Stories are really a key way to, to make that happen. So, I want to talk about sure. that when we get back with my guest, Paul Smith. Hi, this is Andy. Connect and Sell is used by sales reps at nearly a thousand companies, including hundreds of technology startups and several Fortune 500 companies, to overcome the challenges of getting prospects on the phone. Companies using Connect and Sell grow their revenues faster by enabling their sales reps to have more sales conversations in 90 minutes than they could otherwise achieve in an entire week. Connect and Sell can be deployed directly to your sales reps, or you can take advantage of their outbound on-demand service, which delivers qualified prospect meetings scheduled directly on your sales reps' calendars. Visit connectandsell.com to learn more about how Connect and Sell can start filling your pipeline today. All right, we're back with my guest today, Paul Smith, talking about stories and sales. And I want to talk about why stories are so important. And you have some great reasons you list in the book that... I think it really helped people to understand because it's one thing to say they can do these things, but I said you had some very specific uh, things that, that stories do for you. The first one, that, which I really liked, was that stories help the customer listen. Now, we talk about sales being distracted, right? You have to be <laughs> present for your customer. Well, you know, customers are people too. Their attention wanders, you know, especially mm -hmm. if you're presenting dry, boring, factual, logical sequence of events or things that they need to understand, yeah, their attention's going to wander. Stories really helps capture their attention. Yeah, that, that's, that's really true. And it's, it's, um, it's for a couple of reasons. What, one is, it's kind of like when you're in college and uh, the you know, professor was up there writing f formulas on the board and giving you names and dates and things you had to remember for the test and you're like madly taking notes. And then if he or she turned around and just started telling a story or an anecdote or giving you an example – what everybody does in the class is they just they put their pencil down, they lean back, and they just listen because, well, this isn't going to be on the test. This is just a story. So they're totally open to it instead of you know paying so much attention to write everything down. But the, the second reason is is because it, it doesn't sound like a sales pitch. You know, when you're, you're giving your here are the three benefits of my product and here's the price and here's why it's worth all that, all that sounds like a sales pitch and, and your, your buyer's defense mechanisms are on full alert, right? But once you start telling a story, it's kind of like those kids in the college class. They just put down their pencil, they put down their defense mechanism, and they just listen. Because, well, this isn't going to be on the test, or this isn't a sales pitch, this is just a story. And it's much easier to get your message across to them when those defenses are down. Right. And I think for people listening to the show, is that, you know, and we're going to, I'm going to categorize this as a sales story, because it's you know, primarily a sales, <laughs> a sales show, is that what you're talking about in a sales story fundamentally is how another customer, similar to the one you're talking about, had a problem, saw, engaged with you, saw that you ultimately were potentially the solution to that problem, the process they went through to make that decision, and the value they've been receiving from using your product. 
I mean, you're you're touching on all the, sort of the buyer's journey, how they made the decision, and the outcome as we talked about, and you're providing you know really you know pretty incredible social proof if you want to label it as such, right? In a story that really is important in sort of getting past and start building the the trust that may not be existing. Right. And I, I just, I call that a customer success story for lack of a sexier title, but that's, it does exactly what you said. It shows them it's the social proof that says this worked with somebody else without being told, look, this works with all my clients. Okay. Well, I mean, that's, that's, that's mildly convincing, but if you tell me a story about somebody and I get to see the details of exactly how it worked for them and why it's, it's just much more compelling. Well, it's, it's way more compelling. And so Oftentimes, this is the barrier I see with reps when we talk about stories. It's like, well, I don't have stories to tell. It's like, well, of course you do, right? You've got customers that you've worked with. And even if you're a new sales rep, the company has customers they've worked with. You can tell their stories as your own story. It's not always about Mm -hmm. you selling what you personally accomplished, but it's about what your company accomplished as well. So. Right. You just have to go get them. So your, your point is, uh, they say, I don't have any stories. And you say, well, of course you do. Of course you can. You just need to, but you need to go get them. You can't just sit at your desk and expect that all these stories are going to be in your computer or under your desk drawer or something. I mean, you got to invest some time and effort to go collect them. That's why one of the, the la- one of the last chapters of the book, I talk about how, how do you do that? How do you collect these stories? Who, how do you interview people? Who do you interview to, to get these stories? I mean, we, we spend lots of time doing analysis and do, doing research, doing work to come up with our sales pitches. Well, guess what? You need to do some work to come up with your sales stories as well. In fact, I think they're just as, if not more important, than the official part of your sales pitch. So you should expect to spend some time to invest to develop them well. Well, yeah. And my point was, though, is that these can be corporate assets. You know, much yes. as sales pitches and as presentations much as are corporate assets, as much as personal assets are developed centrally, is if you're a business owner or a CEO listening to the show or VP of sales, yeah, you can work with marketing. You can work with other departments in the company to collect these on a you know on a corporate a corporate level, make them available to people, so that you know there's an inventory just like there's brochures and collateral. Stories can be another okay. level of content that if you don't have your own, if you're newer, there's a place you can go tap into it. Right. Yeah, I, I call it a story database. You, everything else in a company of any importance is in a database somewhere, and and stories should be no different. Yeah, absolutely. So another thing about stories, you talked about it appeals to the emotional side of decision making, is that that you know power of story is that at every step of somebody's decision making process, they take a mental trial of your product or service. It's just, you know, it's you research how people make decisions, that's one essential step that everybody goes through, no matter what sort of product or service they're buying. The way you do that though is through a story. You know, story enables your potential buyer to take that test drive, a mental test drive, if you will, of the service or product that you're selling. Right. And maybe that's why it seems like our, our certainly our most important decisions, but many of our decisions tend to be made in that emotional processing part of the brain. And then we, we convince ourselves later logically and rationally why we made that decision. But that, the truth is our, our brain made the decision more emotionally earlier. And it's just a, a rationalization process later. Yeah, I mean, I always remember a, a, a story, if you will, back early in my career where I was out selling to a very large company, and and this was you know, back in the back in the nineties, hate to say, is that long ago, but uh, we're selling to one of the world's largest companies, and went out and made a visit to the company with my CEO, and we were going to design a product for scrap from scratch for this company, and they had, gosh, they had thousands of engineers. And my CEO just couldn't understand why they would choose to have us develop a product for them that they had all these thousands of engineers sitting around that they could do. But you know, we'd created such a compelling story about the value they're going to get from the the way that we were going to design and build the product with some unique capabilities that, that I didn't think they would be able to match, and most importantly, in a time frame that they couldn't deliver in. But he was such he was an engineer; he's very logical. Just saw it black and white. And I just knew these guys had bought into the story that we had told them and, you know, ended up betting with the CEO about we were going to win the order and won the bet. But it was, <laughs> it was very much an emotional decision, yeah. but it was really based on the story that we had created about how we were going to get them to market sooner with capabilities they couldn't have developing it, developing it themselves. 
Well, good for good for you. So chalk one up for storytelling. Yeah, that definitely works. So other thing about stories I think are really compelling is that they're easier for buyers to remember. And you talk about that in the book, is that in these days and age, if you're especially in a complex sale or enterprise sale, research is coming out. There's 5.4 decision makers on every every opera sales opportunity. Yeah. Is that you need to have stories that can be remembered and retold uh, from either by your champion within the account or by members of the team, the decision making team, or based on the challenger customer book that's come out, you know, your mobilizers that, uh, mm-hmm. and that really becomes an important role for storytelling. Right, because it, you can't be in the room with all 5.4 of those people every time they're discussing you know, the decision on your product, right? So like you said, your, your sponsors or other people uh, that are influencing those decision makers, you want them, you want them to be able to repeat your entire sales pitch. But the truth is they can't. You know, they don't have all of your materials. They don't have the product and spec sheets in front of them. You know, they're, they're just not going to remember all the facts. But what they can remember is the stories. And so that's why you want to have stories included in your pitch because it's likely to be the only thing they're going to remember. And, uh, and, and so that's why to have them there is because they'll, they'll be able to repeat them. And all, these, all this research says that you know, stories are uh, between six and 22 times more likely to be remembered. You know, the facts in them are more likely to be remembered if they're embedded in a story than if they're just given to people as a list. And, um, and you know, depending on which of those uh, studies you believe in, it doesn't matter. It's, they're, they're all much more memorable embedded in a story. And so for, for all of those reasons, you're going to want to have those as part of your sales pitch, not just for your own benefit as being the salesperson, but so you can make better salespeople out of your, your sponsors inside the company. Yeah. Well, I think if you even, you know, harken back to, uh, uh, Joseph Campbell's book, the power of myth Mm -hmm. back years and years ago, where, yeah, his, one of his, uh, theses, I think is that, you know, over eons of, uh, human beings repeating stories or something like the story core storytelling uh, code is almost embedded in us genetically, right? That stories become so important to us there. We all need stories. Right. We, we do. And, uh, and uh, I think he did some very important work. The only, uh, the, the problem I end up having with Joseph Campbell, quite frankly, is that um, many exec, he, he's very popular. And so many executives have heard of that work or, re- or read that book. And, and, and that's quite frankly, why many of them are dissuaded from trying it because you know his hero's journey story structure is 17 steps long and people think oh my i've got to create the 17 step no you, you don't it if you're writing a uh, you know your a 200 page fiction novel or you're writing your first screenplay or you you know you you've moved to hollywood and you're going to be a, a movie producer you know great knock yourself out with with joseph campbell's 17 step hero's journey story structure but if you're going to tell a two-minute story, and by the way, that's about the average length of a sales story, two minutes. If you're going to tell, tell a two-minute sales story to a buyer in an office, you don't need nor do you have time for a 17-step plot structure. You need something much, much simpler. And that's part of why I created this book is to give people what is the simpler structure to a sales story versus a movie or a Holly, you know, Hollywood or a Harlequin romance novel or something like that. Well, I think that Campbell notwithstanding is, is that – you know, if you look at the basic story structure that that's used in scripts and books and so on, it's it's much more akin to what you lay out in your book, which right. you know is really a very simple simple process. So, um, so let's quickly here at the end, a few minutes we have left, is let's talk about sort of the first steps you take in creating stories. Yeah. So, um, like I said, I, I've got a structure in the book, and it's uh, you know the hook, the context, challenge, conflict, and resolution. And after that, of course, you get into your action item, which is you you know you want them to buy your product or the lesson that you learned. But it's probably easiest to understand just based on the questions that you have to ask yourself and you have to answer for the, uh, the for the buyer. And, and here are those questions. The first one is, what do you want the audience to think, feel, or do as a result of hearing your story? So if this is a begin with the end in mind. Do you want them to buy your product or is your goal just to get a meeting with them? I've just met them at a conference and my goal right now is to get a sales call with them. So once you've got that figured out, you know, 
then you've got to go figure out what your story is. And there's a whole, you know, a couple of chapters in the book about how do I figure out what story I want to tell, you know, and if you're looking for a success or a failure of accomplishing that in the past, and you, you build your story around that. And then the questions you ask kind of flow pretty naturally. It's uh, the first question you need to ask for the buyer is why should they listen to your story, <laughs> right? I've got two minutes of story I want to tell you, but if you don't give me a reason in the first five seconds why it's interesting to me or going to help me, I'm going to stop listening or I'm going to throw you out of my office, right? So, so that's the hook. The, what, what is, why should I listen to the story? Then you get into the real story questions. Where and when did it happen? Who's the hero and what did they want? What was the problem or opportunity they faced? What did they do about it? Here's the real conflict with the villain, between the hero and the villain. And then how did it turn out at the end? And then you're done with the story and you transition out of the story into these two questions. What did you learn from it? And what do you think I should do about it? You know, and the I in that case is the buyer. So you're telling the buyer, so given all of that and what we've just learned from this story, here's what I think you should do. Either please take a, a call with me or buy my product or you know, pay the price on what you pray or whatever your objective of that particular story is. But though, if you answer those questions, you've basically scripted out a story. Yeah, and I think the... The first story that people personally, I think the first story sales reps should practice on is the one that they get probably most frequently if they're going to meetings or trade shows or something is the simple, what do you do? Right. Question. And that is the perfect place for a story. You know, as, as, as you said, you lead off with, you know, let me, let me illustrate, you know, with a story about how we've, you know, solved problems for, for our customers that's something somebody will listen to as opposed to saying, well, yeah, we're a 20-year-old company founded in a garage, blah, 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 blah. Right. Right. And often people rattle off their job titles and, and some you know, obscure language about what they do about maximizing efficiency or something or, <laughs> something or another. And you know, the, the, they leave the conversation not having a clue as to what you actually do. So yeah, you, you tell a short story about what you did for your last client, then it becomes abundantly clear. Oh, that's what you do for a living. I get it. Well, I, I actually need that. Or, or maybe I don't need that and I can move on. But uh, the, the story really explains it, whereas job titles and functions and and uh, you know buzzwords really don't help people that much. Yeah. So if you're in sales and you've been listening to this, you want to say, okay, how do I get my feet wet with stories? Get a story that answers that question. What do you do? Say you're in a trade show booth. Somebody walks up to you, looking around, lost, middle of a big convention hall in Las Vegas, and they ask you the question, what do you do? A story is the most compelling way to answer that question. Right. Exactly. And they don't have to be long. Like I said, the average sales story is two minutes. But in the ones that I collected, some are as short as 25 or 30 seconds, and some are going to be five minutes. But uh, the, the, you've got different – you're going to want to have different length stories and different purpose stories for different purposes. And, and you're right. That's the first one that you probably need to have out of the 24 in your sales kit is what do I do for a living? Yeah. Yeah. So, all right. Well, good. Well, thank you for that. And we're going to finish the show up with some standard questions I ask all my guests. And – you can give me uh, you know, one-word answers, or you can elaborate if you wish. And the first one right. is, you know, when you yourself are out selling, you, Paul, what's your most powerful sales attribute? I think I know the answer, but I'll ask it anyway. Well, I, I would hope it would be my storytelling, since that's kind of what I'm selling. It's a um, setup question for you. Yeah, but often people ask me, why, you know, how did I decide to do what I do for a living? And, and I, I do tell them a story. I tell them a story about, that my dad told me that really – is the story that changed my life literally and got me to quit my full-time job and do this for a living. He, he wrote me a, a letter after I'd asked him, gosh, dad, I'm struggling with this decision. I got, you know, 20 years into my career at this company. I'm too young to retire, but you know, my first book's out and it's doing well. And I'd love to make that my full-time profession writing and, and teaching. But, uh, you know, I got two kids to put through college and that's a really financially, you know, uh, insecure decision to make. And tell me about it. Yeah. Instead of telling me, what to do, he just told me a story about himself that I'd never heard before. He said, son, when I was five years old, I knew exactly what I wanted to do with my life. He said, I wanted to be a singer, you know, like Frank Sinatra or Tony Bennett. You know, my dad's 82 years old. That's his, his genre. And he said, uh, in fact, uh, I knew that on the first day of first grade, the teacher asked if any of us had any special talent. He said, I raised my hand and I said, I'm a singer. Well, of course, the first thing she does is invites him to stand up and sing a song, right? Mm -hmm. So he did. And he, he stood up right there a cappella in front of all the students and his teacher. He sang his favorite song. And he said, son, I nailed it. <laughs> he said, I got all the words right, the melody. I was so proud. And the teacher and the students stood up and they applauded me. 
And he said, that's the moment that I knew that this is what I was destined to do with my life. And he went on in this letter to say, you know, unfortunately, that turned out not just to be the first time in my life that I stand up, stood up and sang in front of an audience, but it turned out to be the last time. He said, life just got in the way. You know, and the truth is, I just never had the courage to pursue it. And he said, that was 75 years ago, and there's not a month that goes by that I don't regret that decision. And he said, and it's just too late. And I said, someday, son, you're going to wake up, you're going to be 80 years old like me, and it's going to be too late to pursue your dream. You know, and he, he literally closed, as if that wasn't enough, And he closed this letter with these words. He said, I'd love to see you achieve your dream, but that doesn't mean in your lifetime, son. That means in mine. And I mean, tick tock, you know, that just mm-hmm. that hit me right in the heart. I and mean, he, my dad had laid down this gauntlet in front of me and challenged me to pick it up. And so literally two days later, I walk into my boss's office and I resigned from my 20 year career to do this for a living. And it was absolutely the best decision ever made. And I, and I would not have done it, at least not that soon, without that story. Excellent. Well, I think we're going to leave it at that. That's a perfect way to end the show with a great story from my guest, Paul Smith. So, Paul, tell folks how they can find out more about you and how to learn how to tell stories. Yes, thank you. Uh, so, my, uh, my website's probably the best way. It's www.leadwithastory.com. And you can find all my, all my books there or, or on Amazon. And this one, of course, is uh, Sell With a Story. Excellent. Well, good. Well, thank you again, Paul. And remember, friends, make it a part of your day every day to deliberately learn something new to help you accelerate your success. And an easy way to do that is to make this podcast accelerate a part of your daily routine, whether on your commute, in the gym, or make it part of your morning sales meeting, because then you'll make sure you don't miss any of my conversations with top business experts like my guest today, Paul Smith, who shared his expertise about how to help accelerate the growth of your business. So thanks for joining me. And until next time, this is Andy Paul. Good selling, everyone. Thanks for listening to the show. If you like what you heard and want to make sure you don't miss any upcoming episodes, please subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or Stitcher.com. For more information about today's guests, visit my website at andypaul.com.